most of the time we start with a fast song, get you moving, get you get your heart pumping. But this morning, we're just going to bring it down a little bit um, and take this time to truly worship the Lord of our lives. And I just, I, I encourage you this morning to just put aside everything that is troubling you today and truly worship the Lord our God this morning. Will you stand this morning?
We are going to be in 1 John uh, chapter 1, verse 1. Do you have your Bibles? Turn there. 1 John chapter 1, verse 1. Turn there now. We have a lot to cover this morning. And what we're going to do is I am actually going to read 1 John chapter 1, verse 1, all the way to 1 John chapter 4, verse 12. If you're that person, you're like, that's too much scripture. We'll help you. Um, 
First John chapter 1, verse 1, that which was from the beginning, that which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life, the life was made manifest, and we have seen it and testified to it and proclaimed to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. And that which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things to you, so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you, that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Chapter 2. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the propitiation of our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And by this we know that we have come to know him, if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, truly the love of God is perfected. And by this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Beloved, I'm writing to you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I'm writing to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. I'm writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his namesake. I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I'm writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, children, because I know you could be because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the boastful pride of possessions is not from the Father, but from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. Children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come already. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would, they would have continued with us. But they went out, that it might become plain that they all are not of us. But you have, you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you all have knowledge. I write to you, not because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Whoever, who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist. He who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has a Father. Whoever confesses the Son has a Father also. And let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. And if what you heard from the beginning abides in you, there you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he made to us, eternal life. I write these things to you so that about these things, uh, about those who are trying to deceive you, but the anointing that you received from him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about everything and is true and is no lie, just as he has taught you, abide in him. And now, little children, abide in him, so that, so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame as his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. Chapter 3. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. And you know that he appeared to take away sin, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning, and no one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one, 
Let, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. And by this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We should not be like Cain, who was, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. And whoever does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. And by this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brother. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. And by this we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our heart before him. For whoever, for whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart, and he knows everything. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whenever we ask, we receive from him, because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. And this is the commandment, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he has commanded us. Whoever keeps his commandments abides in God, and God in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the spirit in whom he has given us. Chapter 4, beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. And by this you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus is the Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard is now, was coming, and is now in the world already. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is greater in you than he who is greater in the world. They are from the world, therefore they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Verse 7 through 12. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us. That God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. Let's pray. Father God, Lord, first of all, we just want to praise you and thank you for always being with us, for always being near us. God, I just pray right now for the hearts of people in this room. Lord, I just praise you right now in advance for you are going to work a miracle in our lives today. I praise you right now in advance, Lord, for strongholds to come down, for chains to be broken, and for you to enlighten us in a new way of how we can better love you and how we can better love people. Jesus Christ, all that we do is because of you. You are great. You are glorious. You are good and holy. You are the alpha, you are the beginning, you are the creative creator, you are direct. Lord, you are effective and efficient and fruitful. Lord, you give us faith, you are good and glorious, you are independent. You don't need us, but you still choose us. God, you are indescribable. You are a just king, you are full of love and mercy. Lord, you are nearby, you are always with us in times of trouble. You are omniscient, you are our pathway to peace. God, we praise you. Holy Spirit, we need you this morning. Show up in our lives and show us more of who you are. In Jesus Christ, it's by your blood, by your sacrifice that we pray. Amen. Wow, what an intro, right? Uh, Seven-minute intro, reading straight through Scripture. Um, guys, are you guys awake this morning? Cool. This side is awake. You guys are working on it. It's okay. No big deal. Um, guys, listen up. We have so much to cover this morning. As you guys have already told, we actually read through all of 1 John, what we've covered thus far. So whenever Pastor Kenny told you to read your Bibles at home, so you can get caught up. If you didn't do that, we did it for you today. But this week, you actually got to read through 1 John, okay? 
Is that a promise? You guys going to read First John? Awesome. Guys, we're going to cover a lot today. We have a lot to cover. It's going to be some awkward conversations because I believe awkward is awesome. So we're going to cover a few topics today um, that are hard to stomach for some people. And if that is you, it's okay. Don't forget, if you don't like that, then please email Kenny. Do not email me. Um, e- um, I'm very serious. Yeah, Kenny Todd, 73 at gmail.com. Email him and tell him your complaints. But guys, he is actually right now, um, if you guys don't know this, I'm not the senior pastor here. Um, I work here part-time. Actually, I work at the youth center full-time. Uh, I'm in charge of our middle school to college age Bible studies. I lead a couple Bible studies for Wednesday night for middle schoolers and high schoolers and college age. We have a Thursday night Bible study. I lead a Saturday morning men's Bible study here at 8 o'clock. So if you guys are men and you like bacon in the Bible or just the, or even just bacon and you come for the Bible, it's okay. Um, come Saturday morning at 8 o'clock. Um, we do a lot here at Grace City Church. Um, God has given me the opportunity to even to preach here at Grace City Church. Um, I work at the youth center here in town, and I teach kids. I'm a program director there. It's awesome. I'm a, I'm a father of an eight-month baby girl who is super cute um, and married to an awesome woman who's smoking hot um, for almost four years now. or Something like that. I don't really know. Math's, math's confusing. Um, and my favorite thing about all these things is I am so unqualified to do any of that. Like, if you know me at all, you know that my talking is not always eloquent. You know that, to be a fact, right? If you've ever talked to me for a while, you know that I don't always say things right or get things right. If you know me for a while, you know that my wife gets annoyed because I just don't, I try to get on her nerves 85% of the time. Other, I'm sleeping the other time, so I can't do it then. Like, if you know me at all, you know that as I was going through college, I stopped my junior year and never actually finished quite yet. Right? Well, my mom doesn't know that yet, but it's okay. Now she knows, right? I am not qualified to speak to you guys in the morning. I'm not qualified to lead a youth group. I am not qualified to lead all these men at men's Bible study. I am not qualified to work as a program director. In fact, when somebody asks me who's in the medical profession, they say, well, how are you able to get this job? And I tell them, I have no idea. So what do you do? Like, like, what is your qualifications? Like, we talk to school teachers, and they're like, well, you guys work at the youth center. How are you qualified? And I tell them, no idea. I, I love people for where they're at, and that's just about it. I don't have this crazy, awesome PhD. One day, maybe I'll get it, or I'll just write PhD in front of my name and call it a day. I don't, I don't know. But I want you guys to know I, I love this idea so much because I am probably in this room, I am one of the most unqualified undereducated people in this room, but God's given me a platform, not because of what I have done for him, but because of what he has done in me. Right. Amen? <laughs> and today we're going we're to cover so much text and so much conversations because we want us to know two very important things. I'm going to give you all of the information at the very beginning, then we're going to dissect it. I was writing this down. If I wanted you to know one thing, I want you to know this, that God loves you so much even though you're a sinner. And I was writing this for you. Well, he loves you in spite of your sin. No, he loves you because of your sin. This is a baffling concept that our God loves us, right? And then what do I want you, why do I want you to know that? Because some of us need to be reminded of how much God cares for you as a person. Because some of us in our lives, we don't have people that actively pour into us, that actively tell us that we're loved. And that's okay, because don't forget, God loves you. Well, I sin a lot, you're right, but God's grace is so much bigger. And what I want you to do after you know that, I want you to go and tell people about the love that God has given you. Well, why do I want you to do that? Because people are actively going to hell, and it's due to our own laziness of not going and telling people of the gospel message. If you know where to start, start in 1 John chapter 1 and just read all of it. We just did it today in five minutes. It's easy. It's the gospel. Quote John 3.16. God is so good. Amen? Amen. Well, here's what we're going to do today, guys. We're going to cover systematic Lee, we're going to cover 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 through 12. We're going to walk through verse by verse and kind of break apart different things. I want to highlight for you guys this Sunday morning. After that, then we're going to cover three points that is a how-to guide, and it's a how-to love people. So you guys remember last week, Kenny was talking about, Kenny Todd, our senior leader, he was talking about loving people. And we should love the brother, not just in word or speech, but in action and in truth. And today, after I'm done going through 1 John 4, 7 through 12, I want to give you three, a three-step guide on how to love people. 
which you sh- it should be common knowledge. I'm going to give it to you anyways. It's, it's free of charge, all right? Today I'm off the clock. I'm going to give you three steps of how we can tangibly love people. Because if we're honest with ourselves, some of us struggle with that. If we're being honest, some of us are not good at loving people. And, and I, I want to give this information to you this morning. First John chapter 4, first, we are starting in verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. How, how amazing. He says, whoever loves has been born of God. That's like a familial relationship. So what John is doing this in the very first text we're going to read, what he's doing, he's, he's bringing us back to the Garden of Eden. You guys, know, you guys know the story, like in the very beginning, in, in the beginning was nothing, right? There was, there was darkness. The Spirit of God hovered over the darkness. And then God spoke, and then a light came forth, and he created all things. And then he made man, and he made man out of dust, right? That's why we're all dirtbags. He made man out of dust, and then he set him in the garden. This is why women love ribs, because then God took the rib out of man and made a woman. That's why women eat ribs like crazy. It's okay. We, we love you. With barbecue sauce all over your face, that's okay, because you love ribs, because God told you to love ribs, basically, Debatable, I don't know, but basically, right, in Genesis chapter 2. And in that moment was the three of us, well, the six of us, really. One, two, three, four, five. I'm sorry, math's really confusing. The Trinity, Adam and Eve, five, in a communal relationship. God was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. They were one. They were in a familial relationship. They were together before sin came into the world. And so whenever John tells us, hey, guys, we are born of God and we know God, he's bringing us back to the intimacy of walking with God in a hand-to-hand basis. We are fathered. And this, this is what's kind of baffling to me. It kind of blows my mind because if I, was a, if I was a son of someone of royal nature, like let's say, let's say I was a son of Donald Trump, right? Which I don't know how, like, biologically how that works out, but let's just say I was. I guarantee you, I'll be bragging to all of you guys that I'm the son of the president. I don't care your opinion of Donald Trump. I'm not trying to get in a political debate. I don't care about your opinion on foreign policy or abortion. We can discuss all that later, right? We can have a conversation. I love that. But if I was the son of someone that everybody knew, I would love to brag about that. Like, my grandmother's queen of England. What's your grandmother doing? Ah, nothing. Okay. Like, I would, I would love to brag about this because I'm like, you know them from, like, kind of like, 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 like an external perspective. You see my dad on the news. You see my dad wherever. But I actually know him. Like, he took me swimming or he taught me what love looks like. He taught me what hard work looks like. He taught me how to save money. I know him on a personal level. And so imagine, he says, you have been born of God. And you look at the world, and you guys know God from, like, an external perspective. But I actually know him. I'm walking with him. He taught me how to love people. Taught me how to pray. How I read the, the gospel according to Matthew. He's actively moving in my life. He says, we have no God and born of God. We enjoy a relationship with him. And he ushers this first passage in like, with, with a positive spin. It was a positive introduction. Let me move down. Verse 8. Anyone who, who does not love God does not know God because God is Love. Now he brings in like almost a negative introduction. He says, love argues a true and just apprehension of the divine nature. He that loves God loves people. He that does not love people does not love God. Like John sees these two as inexplicably linked. Like you cannot separate the one from the other. If you are somebody walking and you're like, I don't love people, you cannot love God. This is, so, this is baffling. We're going to unpack this in a moment. But if we are not actively showing our love to people around us, we are actively denying the nature and characteristics of Jesus Christ. The wisdom, the greatness, the harmony and usefulness of the vast creation which so fully demonstrate his being. At the same time, show and prove his love and natural reason. When we, when we collect all of these things, we look at the creation. I was just talking to Natalie Moore just a second ago. We're talking about like the mountains and the beauty of creation. When you look at all of these things, it's so hard to deny the existence of God through nature. Romans 1 says so the same thing. When you look at all of these things, the most thing that you will come to is that God is love. And to operate outside of love means to operate outside of God's character. His nature and essence are love. His will and works are primarily love. The latter part of verse 8, God is love. Now, let, let, let's be very clear for a moment. Do not, miss, this, this, now I'm going to get really mean, right? So just be, bear with me. Do not read this verse 
and tell somebody, love is God. This is is weird, right? God is love. Do not tell someone love is God. Because love, as man can comprehend, cannot dictate the parameters of God's greatness in our lives. God is love, and God is the measuring stick of how we measure what love looks like to people. Love does not define God. God always defines love. You hear me? I know it sounds weird, but but love cannot dictate the eternal nature and gravity of the glory of an omniscient, omnipresent, and omnitemporal God. But God defines such the parameters for what love looks like to mankind. Well, how do we know that? We'll go to to verse 9. And this love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son so that we might live through him. The love of God, the incarnation represents the ultimate expression of love. The ability to get out of heaven and come to earth for 33 years to live a life that we couldn't live, to die a death that we deserve so that we can have fellowship with him. That is completely selfless, that is all about nobody else other than God's glory and them loving people that are undeserving. This is the measuring stick of how we measure God's love. And then the very last part is so great. And we live through him. Let me ask you a rhetorical question. When was the last time that you could say you actually operated in living through the person of Jesus? Like when was the last time you woke up late at night to go help somebody do something? When was the last time that someone called you, you knew they were going to ask for help, and you didn't really want to do it, so you just ignored the phone call? When was the last time that you operated and you said in your heart and your mind, I am right now living through the Son of Jesus? Or was it all about yourself? We live through him. I mean, with him, through him. We have our peace. We have our understanding. We have our joy. We have our essence. We have our being wrapped up in the person of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. So let's go live through him. In this, in, this, in this, verse 10, and this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation of our sins. Propitiation refers to the, the reconcili- reconciliation significance of Christ's death and resurrection. Verse 11, beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to, we ought to Love one another. Again, these are linked. You cannot separate the love of God and the love of people. And and, and let me me tell you why. If God already deemed people as worthy as dying on the cross, how dare you assume that they are unworthy because of what you think? God has already given them their worth on the cross, and you have no power, no authority, no rule, no reign, no sovereignty to take someone's intrinsic worthiness out of them. It's not your role. It's really harsh. You're right. So, sorry. Verse 12, no one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and in his love is perfected. The reason why we say no one's ever seen God is because we know that God is so glorious that if you were to see him, your skin would melt from your face. This is a fact. Like, so you guys know in the Bible, right? I mean, in fact, Moses asked guys, like, God, I want to see you face to face. And God tells Moses, like, listen, you cannot see me face to face. If you saw me, you would die. But I'll put you in the cleft of the rock, and I'll walk past you. Read Exodus for this. And I walk past you, and then I'll remove my hand. You'll see just the exhaust of my glory. This is why I personally struggle when someone says, like, well, I listen to one missionary, Francis Shane, he was talking about um, one, of, one of his son, uh, his uh, son-in-law, and he was talking to this man, and this man was like, well, I saw God, that's why I'm a Christian, and blah, blah, and, and Francis Shane's son-in-law said, well, you saw God, what was that like? And he said, well, it was, he looked like this, and he did this, and blah, blah, so you actually saw God face to face? And he said, yes, and his son said, I'm going to call you a liar. How can you call me a liar? Because if you saw God in all of his glory, you would die instantaneously. But one day, if you read earlier in 1 John, we read through this, one day, when we see him as he is, we will be like him and be in our glorified state. This is exciting. And if we, and if we operate in love, no one's seeing God face to face, we can show God's characteristics by the way we love people. Amen? All right, man, this is super hard. We just started. We only got 10 more minutes, guys. We're flying through everything. This is, this is awesome. So you guys ready? You guys ready to understand how to love? If you're ready, say Amen. Amen. Awesome. So how to love. This is a, a three-step guide. And what I'm going to tell you right now, this is, 
This is all of my years of 23 years of living on this earth, right? And eight months of being a dad and four years almost of being married. Like, this is all my knowledge. I didn't know three points because it's about the knowledge that I have. It's three points worth, okay? I want to give you guys, and this, what I'm going to tell you, will not only help you love God and not only help you love your spouse, it will help you love your kids, your parents, your friends, your neighbors, your coworkers, your boss. It will help you love everyone that you come in contact with to a better capacity. How to love, number one, right? How to love, number one, is understanding your own finite nature. Understanding your own finite nature. What does that mean? That means you are not infinite. You are not the bee's ness, right? I know you think you are. Some of you guys are like, bro, I am all that in a bag of three potato chips. You are not. You are not pizza Pringles, okay? I'm sorry. You're not. You're that crumbs in the bottom. It's about it. So you have to be, so here's a, here's a very simple fact that we all need to know. We all have crap in our closet. The only difference is your neighbors may stink louder than yours. We all have crap in our closet. Amen? Can we just say that honestly? We all, we all have stuff. So you can't say crap on stage. I don't know. Kenny never gave me a rule book or what to say. Um, we all have stuff that we battle with. And we should remember that as before we judge somebody else next to us. We all have stuff we struggle with. We all have addictions that we struggle with. We all have mindsets that we struggle with. And it's hard, though, right? And, and this is where we come to the awkward topic. If you are that person and you operate under the moral performance narrative, you will have a hard time with this concept. And what the moral performance narrative is, I know it's like kind of like a big lofty term. What that means is you believe that God wrote you into his narrative because you're moral excellence. Because you did so much good stuff. I know I'm telling you stories. I know some of y'all are really upset. That's okay. Email Kenny. Kenny Todd 73 gmail.com, right? That you did so much good stuff. Well, look at my moral character. I made straight A's to school. Nothing bad with that. I never lied. It's debatable. It's a lie, right? I never stole. Okay, we'll see. You know, like, I don't know. And if I did do something, it was no one near as bad as somebody else, right? Like, I did steal one time. I did lie. I used to steal Pokemon cards from Walmart all the time. This is for me. Don't tell Jimmy Fry that. It's a secret. Um, but, like, I do a lot of bad things, but it's easy to look at yourself and away yourself with somebody else and say, well, I am morally better than this person over here because I'm not an addict or I didn't have sexual sin or I didn't do X, Y, and Z. And if you operate under the moral performance narrative, it will be impossible for you to not to look down your nose at other people. But now, this is great, right? Now, now we get like to the, to the nice, things, to the nice side of things. If you operate under the grace narrative, it's, it's, if you're taking notes, write these down. Like, I don't know why you just write these down, right? If you operate under the grace narrative, you know that God wrote you into his narrative simply because of his immeasurable grace for you. Because he said the more sin you have, the more grace you need. The more sin you have, the more grace you need. Now, now Romans 6 will say, does that mean we sin so that grace may abound? By no means. We ought to stop sinning if we can help ourselves. However, because we sin, we have a grace in our lives. And we are God's children, not because of your greatness, but because of his grace. Amen? Amen. You know what the best part about that is? Your continued involvement with him as a believer is not on you. It's on him. And his grace will never fall short. I love this. Next one, right? Now, now, now we get off. Next one. We celebrate diversity. I mean, James 2 says we don't show partiality. So we celebrate Diversity. This is where it's super awesome to talk about because in Sullivan, we are one of the most diverse cities in all of Missouri. All of you guys should be laughing. That was a hilarious joke to me, right? We celebrate diversity, right? So we look at people and we say, even though you're different, that's okay. For example, if you were to have this guy walk down the street, what would your, don't say this out loud. Please don't say this out loud. Please, listen, listen, guys. Do not say it out loud. So this guy walk down the road, what would your first response be? Don't say it out loud again. Do not. It's okay. Keep it to yourself. Right? We will have an immediate, a presupposition on who this individual is. And we would say, if I was having a barbecue, and I was not people to dinner, he would be one guy that I probably would not invite. And, and then, let's say, well, I'm going to do that, and that's great, and that's awesome. I love you. This is what we do the next category. The next category is on the other side of the fence. We say, well, I simply refuse to see color. Right? This is what people say, like, they're colorblind. This is, this is baffling. First of all, let me just say this. If you are colorblind, and you watch a black and white movie, what are two colors you always see? Black and white. So it's okay. We don't have to run from color. We can simply say, you are different from me, and that's okay. Because God never says that you are on the same level as God, so he loves He says, you're different than me, and because of that, I still love you. 
It's okay for people to celebrate diversity. It's okay to say someone's different. Their culture is different. Their, their race is different. The way they talk is different. The way they look is different. That's okay. You want to celebrate diversity, right? I, I, I love this so much. Invite them to a barbecue. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you guys this quote. I have two more things. We've got to run through it. Okay, we only have four minutes left. Some of you guys, were, you guys are talking way too much. Um, I'm going I'm to tell you guys this phrase. I want you guys to write this down. I'm not kidding. Right now, get your phones out. Everybody, get your phones out. If you don't have a, a notepad, you can text it to yourself. So right now, I'm, I'm watching you, actively watching. Get your phones out right now. I'm going to say this quote. I'm seeing you. Get your phones out. I see you. Yep, front row. I see you. Yeah, I see you. Not getting your phone out. If we love God most, we will love others best. Write that down. Like right now, like text yourself or text your spouse, but don't text your spouse so they know to love you better, but text your spouse so you can remember, right? Don't do that. We love God most, we will love others best. If we are so focused on loving God more than anything else, we will naturally love people more. Like we're so focused on serving him and worshiping him and living a life worthy of him, we will naturally love other people. It just comes out. It's a, it's a natural byproduct of loving God. Because God is what? Love. Very last thing. Very last thing. Is, is we as believers, you say all these things, and your first question is, well, why? Like, why should I love people? Why should I do these things? We as believers need to remember our why and why we love people. And so you guys know, we're about to have graphic images on the screen, so if you're not ready for that, you should probably just leave now just so you know. Um, we're going to play some um, graphic images behind me um, from the crucifixion. So if you're not ready for that, then that's, that's your warning. But we've got to remember why we operate in love. Because so many of the times I think that we, we read like John 3.16 and we read about the crucifixion and we celebrate Easter and we celebrate Christmas and we do all these things that we sometimes forget the gravity of what Jesus Christ actually went through for you. Like I, I don't know if you guys know that you are not all that great. But God in all of his greatness died for you. And he not only lived, he not only said he loved you, but he did it through expression, through an actual action. He said, because I love you, I am willing to prove it. And so many times in our lives, we are not people who are actively proving our love to those around us. We say, well, yes, I love you, but we don't, we don't show it. Like, we are not always a people. It's like, don't, don't hate me, right? This is almost like a condemning message, but it's not trying to be. I'm trying to let you know that God loves you inexplicably great, and he has so much glory and greatness and love for you. I want you to know that. And with that knowledge, we should go then change our life and love people. Because no one has seen God. And so it's our job to live a life that's worthy of his love, that's worthy of his sacrifice, so we can show others the greatness of his, of his kingdom. Amen? Like there, let me just tell you this, 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 this reality real quick. As believers Sunday morning, there are people that are actively going to hell today because of our own selfishness of not wanting to tell them about the Savior. Like there are people in your life that you walk through and you walk past on a daily basis and they are struggling, they are hurting, and we don't have the ability to tell them, hey, God loves you. Like, you don't have to know all of the verses. You don't got to know all of the wisdom. All, again, 23 years old, married for a couple years, have a baby girl. That's about it. My expertise is slim to none. But if we cannot operate in love for people, we are always going to be failing people. And we are always going to be failing the nature of God. Because God is what? Because God is what? God is love. So yes, we look at someone. We say, yeah, we celebrate your diversity. It's okay. You can be different. We still love you. And, and this, that, that's a very deep concept, right? If you're that, and this is going to be very specific towards only a small people in here. If you have a child, let me, be very, let me be very clear. If you have a child or a friend who battles being homosexual, A, we believe it's a sin. We don't support it. But B, it's okay they come over to house for dinner. That's okay. Is that different? Yeah. Is that a sin? Yes. Do we love you? Yes. But we want to engage in relationship with you. People will not change if we refuse to love. So why do we love people? Because we remember the cross. Remember what God did for us. Remember how great and glorious and majestic it was at this moment. 
completely exhausted, carrying a cross that was not his. Also, we could be here this morning in a country that, that gives us freedom to worship. Sometimes the freedom to worship, which was so great, and Philly Glass coming up, and we're excited about that. Sometimes the freedom of worship makes us forget the price that something we actually pay. Guys, God has always loved you. He has a complete and utter reckless love for you as a person. Like, and, and I'm, I'm about to end. I'm actually over right now. And I want you guys to know this real quick. Before you guys leave, before you guys do anything else, I want you to know that God has a, an indescribable love for you. If you don't believe it, just remember the crucifixion. Like, he is actively chasing the one, leaving the 99 and chasing the one. And he begs us to do the same. Here's what we're going to do here, here in a moment. Um, I want us to remember that God is love and that God does love us. And so we're going to sing a song. Um, here's here's, here's kind of like my, my goal in doing this, right? Because I want to be very clear in my, in my goal and expectations. Um, we're going to sing you after I pray. You are free to leave. You're free to go. There's no, like, pressure to stay here or whatever. You're free to go and go about your day and go get lunch and crack a barrel. It's okay. But if you're that person, you need to be reminded of love or you know God's love. You just want to celebrate his love. We invite you to sing and, and, and worship with us for a moment. Wes is going to sing as long as she needs to, okay? We're, they're here as long as they need to be, right? I told them one song, they can be here for however long. And I'm going to be up front as well as hoping some of our prayer team. I didn't tell you guys in advance, but thank you guys for being flexible on that. Because after I pray, like I said, you guys are free to leave. But if you do leave, please be quiet and leave these first at least three rows open so people can pray if they want to or worship if they want to or get prayed over if they need to. And guys, don't forget, God loves you. And out of that love, we love people. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, Lord, we thank you so much. God, we praise your name. You are the alpha, the omega, the beginning and the end. You are creative. Husband, Lord, you are Yahweh. You are the great I am. You are all things that we are not. And even though, God, we do not always operate in love, you always operate in love. Lord, you look at our sin, you look at our shame, you look at our past, and you say, I love you and I want that one. Jesus Christ, we praise you for your sacrifice. We praise you for your word. We praise you for the gospel. Lord, you are great. You are majestic. You are mighty. And because of you loving us, I pray you give us the ability courage, the audacity to go and love people. Just go live a reckless life where we recklessly love people. God, we can look at someone, we can say, in spite of what you're going through, I want to love you. I want to give up some of my wealth. I want to give up some of my time. I want to give up some of my energy just so I can love you. I'm going to give you free food and, and, and free situations and, and free stuff. And they ask, well, why do you love me so much? And we can say, because God loves you so much as well. And he loved me first, so I love people as well. And it's only natural, it's only right, it's only righteous that we would operate in the same man that you operate with us. God, you did not love us so we can feel self-love. You loved us so we can love the masses. You have blessed us so we can bless the masses. God, you are great. Jesus, you are worthy to be praised. Holy Spirit, I pray right now you fill this room. I pray you fill the hearts of people in here. I pray you fill the minds of people in here. But I pray that person that's bound, that, feel like they, that they're not loved, you remind them of your sacrifice to show them and prove to them your love. I pray you shout out to the mountaintops, God, that you are good and you are loved. Jesus Christ, it is in your sweet, holy, and precious name we pray. Amen. Guys, you guys, Great City Church, you guys are all dismissed if you want to. If not, that's great. We just want to spend a moment just to worship. So just, if you're going to leave, just leave quietly. But thanks so much.